Uh, so <coughs> this afternoon I'd like to talk a little bit about the particular aspects of inspection and control concerning <coughs> aquaculture and then we'll move on to some aspects of uh, monitoring because it is a <coughs> particular requirement in relation to aquaculture products and maybe finish the afternoon talking a little bit about wider aspects of uh, monitoring food safety conditions in the fishery sector. Uh, but to, <coughs> to start with food safety hazards in aquaculture, uh, aquaculture is more or less uh, relatively anyhow a new activity uh, for many of us involved in official control of fishery products uh, in that whilst there have been aquaculture activities practiced for thousands of years it's only in the last 30 or 40 years that they have become a, uh, an important commercial activity and started to contribute significantly uh, to fish supplies so that now according to the latest FAO data uh, something about like half of the fish consumed in the world is from uh, aquaculture origin and of course <coughs> the regional production is very much focused around Southeast Asia where in China and Vietnam and uh, countries like this there are massive aquaculture sectors but we also see in other regions uh, important production systems emerging in Europe where we have salmon farming and sea bass and sea bream farming. We have a very important aquaculture sector in Egypt uh, where tilapia farming is, is undertaken and then within the Americas we see countries like Ecuador and to an extent uh, Colombia uh, also engaged in significant aquaculture activities and we know that in the Caribbean region that there are a number of initiatives there are several uh, commercial operators in shrimp and tilapia farming uh, in Suriname for example in uh, Guyana and also many of the smaller countries have pilot production uh, uh, in place with, an, with a view to developing this sector in the future. So the expectation is that uh, application of official controls to aquaculture products will become a more important part of our work in future as this sector uh, develops in the region and today I want to talk in this session about uh, some of the hazards which we find in aquaculture products which are more or less uh, specific to uh, those products uh, not exclusively but, uh, but within the fish inspection world uh, we have to focus particularly on these three areas of aflatoxins, fungal toxins, veterinary medicines and parasites because what is emerging is that these are the hazards which uh, increasingly we are seeing popping up in surveys, in studies which have been done regarding hazards in aquaculture products and which we uh, therefore have to start taking into account in our inspection and control activities. Okay, so mycotoxins are fungal, uh, fungal toxins, they come from a range of different uh, uh, fungi, microscopic fungi, but the two uh, genera which are mostly uh, implicated are Aspergillus and Fusarium. So these are microscopic uh, uh, 
Yeah, good idea. Microscopic uh, <coughs> fungi, and they typically grow on uh, grains and uh, some pulses, and also on things like dried fruits. They're particularly uh, partial to low water activity uh, products and they produce a wide range of different toxic uh, materials and the problem is that these products may be consumed directly people may eat moldy maize or they may eat moldy groundnuts uh, but as far as we are concerned, we're interested in these things because uh, these products are often incorporated in animal feeds, in fish feeds, and therefore the toxins can enter the, uh, the food chain via the feed and uh, therefore contaminate the final product, which is, in the case of food animals, either the meat, the flesh, the muscle or uh, the milk or also don't forget that humans also eat other bits of fish as well such as sometimes the eggs or the liver and so on which may also uh, carry forward these uh, mycotoxins um, so within the Aspergillus genus there are two Uh, fungi, two species which are commonly implicated, Aspergillus flavus and Aspergillus parasiticus, and they produce not just one chemical but a suite of different uh, toxins, and these are given letters to distinguish them from each other, uh, and they're all identifiable by chromatographic uh, methods. Uh, they proliferate, the fungi, the fungal spores are around in many, many areas. Uh, it's not that they're specifically located to one area or another, they are ubiquitous, uh, particularly in tropical regions. And they can grow under conditions of relatively high uh, humidity uh, and high temperature. So, very often we're looking at poorly stored uh, raw materials which are used in animal feeds or we're looking at poorly stored feeds themselves. And typically what is implicated are these oil seed meals. So, if we take things like palm oil or groundnut oil or cottonseed oil, when the uh, uh, seed has been crushed and the oil is extracted uh, very often in what is left it's used as an animal feed and the aflatoxin content of that residue of that uh, meal is, is what carries forward into the uh, food supply chain. But there is also the possibility that some of these fungi can grow on crops before even they are harvested. Uh, under certain conditions of humidity and high rainfall and uh, 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 high temperatures, we can see the crops being infected uh, and the fungi growing prior to harvest. So it's not just storage conditions, it's also uh, conditions during growth. This is a picture of a uh, sporing head of Aspergillus under a microscope and these are the, the little spores which uh, distribute it around. Uh, <coughs> so here's a list of all of the different uh, fungal toxins, the mycotoxins which we uh, have identified over the years, there's a wide range of them. Uh, it's really these three which we're concerned with, these first three, uh, 
which were concerned with in relation to animal feeds. Uh, aflatoxins, uh, cyclopiazonic acid, nocrotoxin, they are the products of the various aspergillus uh, fungi. But there are a whole range of other fungal toxins which get into foods, but these don't really concern us very much from a uh, fish inspection point of view. Uh, because they tend to grow in other, other media, in other products which, don't off, which are not often used for animal for feed. So patulin, for example, grows on apples and uh, ergot grows on uh, grains such as rye and barley and so on. So these are not really uh, linked uh, very much to the fishery sector. But as, as general food safety inspectors, we are of course uh, interested in them and need to be aware of them. Uh, the thing about all of these toxins is that they are all highly toxic, uh, but not all equally toxic. Some are more so than, than others, but they do tend to attack uh, the liver. The site of attack is, is the liver. They can cause tissue damage and that ultimately has been linked to an uh, increase in liver cancer, uh, largely because of the toxic effects uh, of these materials. And in Africa, it's estimated that some 40% of all liver cancers are due to aflatoxins. So this is a major public health issue uh, which is not very well in control. Uh, of course, most of the exposure in places like Africa comes from these kind of products, from groundnuts, moldy groundnuts, uh, rather than via fish uh, as such. But it is something that we need to be careful to monitor in our monitoring programs, and I'll talk about this at a, in a moment. Uh, to monitor the uh, quantities of uh, aflatoxins present in fish feeds. Uh, there are some hot spots, so Mozambique for example, where they have high rates of uh, consumption of products such as this, uh, you can see they have 60 times the rate of liver cancer, so it's a very major public health issue. But there's another issue linked to the consumption of, uh, uh, over the longer term, of aflatoxins, which is uh, linked to stunting and immune system suppression. Uh, so that if a young person, if a child is exposed to small amounts of aflatoxin, which uh, may not cause any acute effects, uh, if they're exposed to small amounts over a long period, it can create sufficient stress on their, on their system, on their body, that uh, they don't grow properly and they remain uh, stunted. Uh, they are susceptible more to infections like TB and malaria and so on, and uh, ultimately the the, the child doesn't thrive as well because of this uh, stress imposed on the system by, by the toxin. And so this is the latest uh, research which has linked uh, stunting to uh, consumption of aflatoxin. So it's perhaps, I think yesterday I mentioned that there are many toxins where we've actually set limits based on acute toxicity uh, characteristics, dosage and response, and now as our epidemiological knowledge is improving, we're finding that these also, some of these also have chronic uh, implications from chronic exposure, and aflatoxin is one of these uh, kind of chemicals. Uh, <coughs> so the preventative measures are preventing mold growth, uh, in harvested products, it means sufficient drying of the meal, uh, of the grains, of the maize or 
the uh, uh, ground nuts or whatever is going to be used uh, in the animal feed. Generally to, uh, for example in maize, below 14% moisture content uh, is, is safe and also it means that during storage not only of the raw material but also storage of finished animal feeds that there should also be uh, proper uh, storage conditions with ventilation and so on. So this is a very nice example here of how uh, animal feeds should be stored always on pallets so that it's not on the ground, air can circulate uh, under the pallet the pallets are stacked with gaps between them and uh, products are not stored against the wall so you can have a good uh, ventilation surrounding the uh, surrounding the product. There's some promising technologies modified atmosphere storage so if you increase the uh, uh, increase the carbon dioxide content around the aspergillus uh, it suppresses its its growth uh, there's another very interesting uh, product on, on the market in that they found that some strains of aspergillus do not produce the toxins. So um, there are one or two commercial products where they actually sell these non-toxic strains of aspergillus and the idea is you seed your crop, your field with these non-toxic strains which then crowd out the toxic strains so you are encouraging the growth of aspergillus or um, not necessarily encouraging it but uh, where it to grow then it would be mostly the non-toxic strains which would grow and therefore uh, you have a reduced level of toxins in the, in the food. Um, and there's work going ahead with different fungicides spraying your crops, spraying your uh, harvested products and looking at the possibility of uh, using genetically modified uh, varieties of products so that they're resistant to attack by aspergillus uh, so there are some of the control activities which uh, we need to take into account but certainly from a food safety of fishery products point of view we need to be thinking about the uh, storage conditions and about including uh, animal feeds for aquaculture within our monitoring programs. Has anybody any experience of controlling these kind of products? Mm. Yeah. Well, if you have a major aquaculture sector, then it's something which needs to be uh, taken into account. Uh, then we have veterinary medicines, which, because the animal is treated with a veterinary medicine, then of course the, that medicine uh, can end up in the food. And we cannot avoid sometimes treating fish with veterinary medicines and in fact it is a, an obligation under animal welfare conditions in many cases. If an animal is sick it should be, uh, uh, that illness should be addressed with a veterinary intervention uh, to try to cure it. So even in organic production you may need sometimes to treat your fish with drugs and that is perfectly permissible in fact it is uh, you know part of the welfare of ensuring the, the, uh, that the animals are treated properly. Uh, so <coughs> occasionally uh, fish are treated with uh, veterinary medicines for health reasons sometimes in some countries uh, animals are subject to veterinary treatments as growth promoting activities 
So it is a fact that if you feed young animals with a low dose of antibiotics, they will grow more quickly. And in some cases, the, uh, I mean not, not that this is permitted, in, certainly in the EU, but uh, in other countries it may be permitted to treat animals with uh, growth-promoting uh, substances, whether they be antibiotics or uh, hormones in, in some cases. Uh, so we're concerned with uh, ensuring that when uh, fish is being farmed that it doesn't have in it any uh, harmful residues of, uh, uh, of veterinary medicines. And there are really two concerns we have from a human health point of view. Uh, one is that there may be some toxic effect on, on humans uh, because of the nature of the substances which are, are applied. Uh, so that's one thing we would worry about. But secondly, very often drugs which are used in animal medis medicine are the same drugs that are used in human medicine. Uh, you know, because an, a broad spectrum antibiotic, for example, which works on a human being will also work to an extent on species of bacteria in, in a fish or any other man, uh, animal. So we're concerned about antimicrobial uh, resistance by having a constant exposure. And what happens is if this an anti, uh, antibacterial substance is present in the food we eat on a continuous basis, then uh, the bacteria in our gut which may include pathogenic bacteria, will evolve to become tolerant to that uh, antibiotic. And then if that is transmitted to somebody else, it, is, uh, it has antibiotic resistance and it means that that drug is then not available for uh, medical or clinical intervention to, uh, by a doctor to treat that illness. So, Anti uh, antimicrobial resistance is one of the uh, uh, risks which we need to address. It isn't a food safety problem per se in that it, uh, these drugs do not harm uh, us as the consumer directly, but there may be indirect harm to human health by transmission of this uh, uh, or by development of this resistance. Yeah. Uh, so they are the concerns we have with uh, human health hazards from uh, residues. And the idea of the controls is to uh, do two things. One, ensure that uh, prohibited substances or illegal substances or substances which are unauthorized, which could cause us direct harm, uh, are not applied to those food animals, that they're not used in a food animal context. So this means there could be different treatment regimes for a given disease in a given species of fish, but if it is going to be used for ornamental fish, for example, it's not for human consumption, you could use certain substances in that situation. If it was going to be used for human consumption, well, of course, you couldn't use them. So you have to always think about the end use of these, of these products. Uh, but primarily where uh, we are uh, uh, concerned to ensure that uh, these unlawful or prohibited substances uh, are not applied to aquaculture products and that where authorized substances are used, in other words permitted drugs which may be the same drugs that we uh, we might want to use for treatment of human uh, health uh, 
situations, that they are used in such a way that the residue levels in the final product do not exceed permitted limits. Uh, primarily because of this concern for uh, uh, resistance, but also sometimes because although these drugs may be used in human medicine, they may have other side effects and things which we don't want to see uh, consumers developing. Uh, so these are the, uh, the concerns and this means that if we have an aquaculture industry in our country we need to have a regulatory framework for veterinary medicines in place and this is not directly an issue which comes under uh, uh, food safety. This is part of the veterinary regime and certainly the OIE uh, with the Animal Health Code and the Aquatic Animal Health Code which are the two international standards which uh, determine the design of animal health control regimes. Uh, this is where we can get clear guidance uh, as to what countries should do to have in place a, uh, a veterinary medicine regulatory framework. And one of the things we often see, uh, particularly in developing countries, is this framework is not very well developed generally for all animals and particularly in the case for uh, fishery products. Um, but what we need for aquaculture or generally is a procedure in place for well several things. So the first one is a procedure for approval and classification of veterinary medicines. So most countries have a, uh, a way of controlling drugs which are supplied to uh, human medicine and they may have as part of that a veterinary medicine committee. Uh, it's organized differently in different countries but the advantage of having those two committees together are that you can then coordinate uh, your approvals because clearly uh, you don't want to have things circulating, well there is a concern that if something circulates and is available for human use uh, but not for animal use that people may use the drugs intended for humans for animals or even vice versa. So there needs to be some coordination there to ensure that when a drug is approved, that it is not just approved per se, but it is approved for certain specific uh, functions, whether it be uh, animal or human, and even then you can also specify the conditions or the classification of the, the drug. So you might classify drugs also according to uh, the extent to which they are permitted for free circulation. Uh, so I think, Stella, you were mentioning the other day that now we have some over-the-counter over medicines which are freely available and then there are different class A, class B drugs which uh, have varying degrees of restriction in their marketing so that in the case of veterinary medicines your class A veterinary medicines are only uh, available uh, on, on prescription from a registered veterinary uh, practitioner and only supplied from a registered veterinary pharmacy. So that would be the highest level of restriction. Uh, so that, that procedure for approval to say what is permitted and what is not permitted and for classification should be in place uh, because that is the first the first step, if you like, to having a, a, a list of controls. 
and <coughs> once again you can have a positive list in other words those things which are permitted and also a negative list so substances which are banned for use in those veterinary applications because what you find is that there are many chemicals circulating in uh, uh, in the world in different countries which actually have very very good uh, pharmaceutical effects but which are toxic to humans and, and you don't want them to be used uh, on your fish or in in food animals uh, so they're not veterinary medicines as such because they don't have a you know they're not classed as a medicine but practitioners will know that for example malachite green which is a green dye used in the textile industry is a highly effective uh, uh, antibacterial and disinfectant which you can use in the aquaculture sector and you know many countries this circulates freely and is often sold directly to aquaculture operators for this purpose but uh, it is actually quite toxic so in some countries they've actually put a specific ban on its use so you would use positive lists and negative lists and if you uh, want to go further you have controls on import production and distribution of controlled compounds so you can have si systems of import licensing or production licensing uh, of course distribution systems you have registered pharmacies for veterinary medicines and certain products are only available via those uh, via those uh, pharmacies uh, there is an issue of smuggling uh, I had a conversation with Nestor uh, in Belize where I think you have shrimp farming and some tilapia as, as well yeah shrimp farms and so you know there is an illegal cross-border trade with smuggling of, of uh, medicines which uh, in many countries we see this we see this something's banned locally but there is still a demand for it from the from the sector so people bring it in and it's very difficult to control because sometimes the quantities you need are are very small uh, then uh, okay controls on prescription and application of certain compounds so that you uh, for certain drugs in your regulations you say these must be prescribed and uh, applied to fish only under veterinary supervision uh, and that means that there would be an extra level of control and then you need to have rules about storage and stock controls on the farm uh, so that for example uh, on farm you would require separate locked facilities for storage of veterinary medicines uh, so there would only be a nominated key holder, holder and uh, entry and exit material of material to and from the store would be recorded so you keep a proper stock control uh, so you do this in rather the same way that you would control separately uh, hazardous chemicals in a food processing establishment uh, with specific uh, record keeping of what goes in and what comes out uh, and then importantly uh, a requirement for keeping of records uh, of the application of veter veterinary medicines to the fish uh, so there are different ways of applying veterinary medicines it can be in a bath so you put it in the water and the fish goes in the water or it can be in the in the feed these are the two typical methods but whichever treatment mode is employed uh, there should be a record kept of every individual 
application of medicines uh, so that you know what has been given on any particular day and to which fish. And that brings us to the next point which is keeping the separation of treated and untreated animals. So you don't mix everything together even after the treatment has finished. You keep them separate uh, because you need to know uh, which are the fish which have been subject to this, uh, this uh, veterinary drug intervention. intervention. Uh, so having proper record keeping is absolutely essential where you identify the cage or the pond which has been treated, you identify the drug which has been applied, the quantities which have been applied, the date and the time, the person who did it and then you have a record of what uh, has been done. And then the principle of holding your treated animals for a period uh, after the last application of the medicine. This is called withdrawal period and what it provides is a time during which uh, the drug can be metabolized out of the system uh, of the animal. And the withdrawal period will be determined by various factors um, and usually this will be noted in the drug record uh, register that for a particular drug which is uh, applied what will be the date after which uh, the withdrawal period will be expired and at that point at the end of the withdrawal period the level of residue in the fish should be below the regulatory limits. So the idea of the withdrawal period is to give enough time for that fish to become compliant. Um, and this is why we undertake some monitoring to check that withdrawal period requirements are being observed. The withdrawal period is dependent on the species, the size and sex of the fish, uh, the temperature, uh, the drug, so these things are quite variable and can only be determined by uh, knowledge and experience uh, which is why it's often the veterinary uh, doctor which specifies the withdrawal period. Then <coughs> finally there's a, you should have also in your regulatory framework a requirement for communication of information. So if fish is sold before the end of a withdrawal period there should be a requirement for the aquaculture operator to inform whoever is buying that from them or whoever is receiving it from them these fish have been subject to a, a veterinary drug treatment. So be aware that there needs to be a completion of the withdrawal period in order for this to be uh, in order for this to be respected. Uh, so these are the kind of things that we should be looking for when setting out a regulatory framework and uh, yeah because if you do want to export to the European Union products from aquaculture these are some of the things that they will come and look for in your regulatory uh, regime. Now from, a <coughs> from an institutional point of view we find this often causes some difficulties because uh, it immediately raises the question who is responsible? Uh, and this is quite challenging because when you think about it, building this system only for fish doesn't make much sense because these controls are the same whether you're applying them to fish or beef or pigs or poultry 
or rabbits or whatever food animal you are producing, uh, you need to have this system in place. So it's much better to have, purely from a logistical point of view, a system which is designed for all food animals. Otherwise you end up with a system for fish over here, a system for beef over here, a system for poultry over here, and in fact uh, they may not be the same and there may be inconsistencies. You get certain drugs available or approved for one animal and not another and so on. And it's much better if you can bring these under a single umbrella. Uh, but then the question is where should that be? Uh, yes, it could be under the veterinary department in the Ministry of Agriculture but again there needs to be some links to human health so it could also be within a pharmacy board or a drugs authority under the Ministry of Health so these kind of questions are immediately raised when you try to build these these systems yeah so development of these regulations is uh, is really the first step in building a aquaculture uh, control system um, and then we need to think about uh, residues of drugs because the the next thing we need to be concerned about is to try and set some limits regarding when we are concerned with permitted substances what are the limits which are permitted in terms of the maximum residue limits uh, in different foods. So we can get information on that. Uh, well, Codex has something to say about it. They list for different medicines, they list Codex recommended uh, MRLs, maximum residue limits. Uh, but to an extent it also depends on what are the national drug policies with regard to the use of these substances in human medicine uh, so that you have a correspondence between them for the reasons explained. Uh, so you can have a look at Codex um, and the EU also has certain specific uh, MRLs which they have set for uh, European aquaculture products and we've set out some of these in the uh, in the corresponding manual so in the uh, in the annex of, of this one on aquaculture we've put some of the uh, permitted veterinary medicines which can be used in aquaculture and uh, the current MRLs which are set in the EU legislation. Uh, bearing in mind that these things do change quite a bit actually. Uh, these are not necessarily static uh, because they vary depending on the uh, uh, over time depending on new drugs coming up and findings regarding uh, uh, toxicity and things like that. Um, so uh, these MRLs are under a, a, a regulation from uh, 2010 uh, but it has been amended several times so you need to keep your eye on these to make sure that if you are engaged in marketing aquaculture products to the EU that your uh, drug regulations for use in aquaculture remain up to date with any changes in the, uh, in the uh, EU legislation. Uh, the other thing though which you, you need to think about is that you know you're dealing with different species of fish sometimes or uh, 
These are designed for European production systems and European conditions. Now, when you're dealing with tropical aquaculture, this is not, this, you know, some of these drugs may not be relevant, may not function so well because of the environmental conditions and because of the species which you are, are working with. So it is entirely permissible to vary from this, providing that you have, uh, you know, prepared the scientific justification to show that it is, uh, you know, the uh, most effective way and that it doesn't cause any adverse effects and that you've shown that these MRLs are safe for humans and, and so on. I mean, that is quite a tall order, but uh, you know, sometimes it, it, it is an option which is available to you. And there is a similar situation with regard to pesticides as well, that although the EU has pesticide MRLs, uh, it's all designed for EU production systems and other countries can use different pesticides providing they do the work uh, to uh, show that their use is, is justified. Okay, so uh, Codex, FDA also has some information on, uh, on veterinary drug residues, but actually the most comprehensive is, is uh, the EU. Uh, lists a much wider range of drugs. When it comes to permitted drugs listed by Codex, which can be applied to fish, it's a very small number. It might just be one or two have been uh, have made it into codex standards uh, because of this long, long process of uh, 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 approval and development which codex standards have to go through. Okay, so what would be the uh, functions of the competent authority in relation to aquaculture products? Well, firstly to get those regulations uh, passed, developed and passed. Monitor the need for drugs and their usage within the sector because you cannot adopt a drug regime for aquaculture without understanding what is the disease status for aquaculture. So that if you see certain diseases developing in certain parts of the country and aquaculture diseases do tend to pop up and come up very quickly and may be introduced from outside when you've never had them before requiring a new drug treatment regime which previously you did not consider necessary. So your choice of uh, drugs which you per permit has to be linked to the disease status of the fish population and the aquaculture system you have. So you need to link this to the fish health controls, the epidemiological aspects of fish diseases. So you need to be on top of those kind of issues. Uh, then you need to have an inspection capacity to make sure that firstly your distribution of the medicines is in line with the legal requirements. So you don't find class A veterinary medicines for sale in unregistered pharmacies for example or in corner shops in aquaculture areas and, and so on. That they are only sold via properly registered and licensed uh, uh, distributors and that uh, where there is a requirement for prescriptions that these are requirements are observed and ensure that aquaculture facilities are uh, following the rules in terms of the way in which they are uh, operating in terms of keeping records and, and uh, having locked facilities for veterinary medicines and so on. Uh, 
And then you need to have a residue monitoring program where you take samples on a periodic basis and sub that subject them to laboratory testing to make sure that uh, all of these things are being complied with. And then finally you have your export certification if it's uh, an EU system. So these are some of the options which uh, you need to consider uh, who often need to be involved at some stage in developing or implementing these functions. And bear in mind also that veterinary medicine control is at the interface of animal health and food safety. So if you're a fisheries department you need to be talking to your veterinary department uh, or have a fish health function within your fisheries institution. Okay. Uh, so typically, and this is in the, uh, in the manual, we have a list of banned substances. Uh, very typically <coughs> things which we find popping up which aquaculture operators do like to use a lot uh, are things like chloramphenicol it's uh, very effective for, particularly for juvenile fish for disinfecting eggs and larvae uh, you can improve your survival rates improve your growth rates with things like chloramphenicol uh, malachite green, nitrofurans, uh, uh, yeah, metroni uh, metronidazole. Several of these crop, crop up regularly in monitoring programs, although they all are uh, banned substances in, in the EU. But they're used because they're very effective at the job that they do. They're cheap easy to use and effective. However, they do have potentially dangerous implications for uh, consumers. They're all persistent, they're all identifiable in the, uh, in the final product. Uh, you'll be aware that uh, many countries have had difficulties getting farmed shrimp uh, into the EU and uh, indeed have suffered bans because of the presence of chloramphenicol. Uh, uh, well, tetracycline is permitted uh, often, yeah. but, but chlor chloramphenicol and nitrofurans, particularly countries like Bangladesh and, and uh, India and Thailand, they've all either suffered or been threatened with bans because of the presence of these substances. And it's very difficult to identify where they come from um, because when you go to the farms uh, they deny using them. Well, of course they would deny using them but you know, you, I think the evidence is that they're not actually used on the farms. So you go to the hatcheries and yeah, there was a time when we know that, uh, say, f aquaculture feed producers in one of these countries was putting some of these substances in the feed. Uh, but that was identified and it was stopped. So, in theory, the product should have had no more chloramphenicol. But there was still, it was still detected in the final product. And what they finally realized was that for the larval shrimp at the very early stages they're fed on a, a, a feed which is prepared on the farm using a chicken egg yolk and that sometimes the chickens had been fed with a feed with some of these compounds in them. So this was in the yolk and then this was getting into the, the shrimp, even though it was a, a larvae, and it was still detectable in the adult shrimp when it went to market. So with very, very small quantities.
But this raised the issue with regard to banned substances. It's a very important issue because the, the idea that many regulatory authorities have, if this is a banned substance, if there is any detectable trace, it is evidence that the banned substance has been used and therefore the product is rejected because it is non-compliant even if there is no evidence that at that level at which it is detected is harmful. It's not a question of harmfulness, it's a question of an illegal treatment has been applied to the product. So this was you know, quite a, a, a major controversy at, at one time uh, and led to the EU actually establishing detection limits because one of the problems was that as analytical techniques were improved, you know, originally when I was, uh, when I first started working on these things, if you could uh, analyze something to parts per million, well, you were, you were doing some really fine chemistry. Uh, now, standard uh, limits of detection on many analytical techniques are parts per billion and we're now even looking at 10 to the minus 12 as a, as a potential resolution of some analytical techniques almost getting down to the molecular level. So the problem was as analytical methods became more and more accurate of course uh, you were kind of chasing these, chemis these chemicals uh, down to smaller and smaller concentrations. So in the end they said, okay, well, uh, there is a, a, a detection limit which, uh, below which we will not consider uh, results as being positive. And so the, uh, for the analytical methods for these uh, banned substances, they actually put some specifications which uh, de facto work as a uh, maximum residue limit. Although they're not called that because they can't call them that because they can't say there is a permissible amount which we will allow because they are in fact banned substances. <coughs> Okay, so there you are, there you are banned substances and you need to have a list of those. <coughs> then you have your permitted substances uh, and there's a range of different <coughs> antibiotics which are typically used in aquaculture. <coughs> uh, so you need to have a list of what is permitted and a maximum residue limit specified. The MRL can be specified in the edible portion, so bear in mind that this may not always just be muscle, it could be eggs if people are eating the roe of fish or it could be uh, could be the liver or, or something else. So they are your veterinary drug control regime which you need to have in your regulations and then you also need to have something which say something <coughs> which sets the conditions on aquaculture business operators to say if you have a fish farm these are the conditions which with which you must comply uh, so this comes down to certain aspects of hygiene and management and so on rather similar to the way in which you specify the conditions for a processing establishment or a landing site or a fishing vessel. So your regulations should have something to say about how to design uh, location, operation of aquaculture facilities. So things like your site location and selection not subject to pollution. You don't want uh, open drains with sewage flowing into the river upstream of your fish farm, for example. 
So you have to look at the surrounding area and uh, determine that it is a suitable location. <coughs> Your ponds have to be managed properly. Uh, one of the techniques which is often used in aquaculture is to fertilize the pond with organic material, with organic manures, uh, because you want to have an algal bloom in your pond, because this feeds the natural productivity of the pond and ultimately allows <laughs> the fish to grow more quickly, particularly with something like tilapia, where it is actually uh, very much a vegetarian uh, feeder. So having a good algal bloom is, is, a, is a good thing. But if you're going to use animal manures, these should be treated uh, with lime so as to kill any bacteria or any eggs of parasites and, and things like that. Uh, then, in terms of your feed supply, um, take care that you're using uh, proper feeds from authorized sources uh, <coughs> where you can get information about the material which has been used in, in the feed. Uh, there's a lot of concern about the entry of uh, material from mammalian sources, slaughterhouse waste and things like that into animal feeds since the beginning of the 90s when we had this uh, BSE mad cow disease which was linked to the entry into the uh, animal food chain into animal feeds of uh, <coughs> nervous tissue uh, from bovines. So take care over the uh, use of different feeds and check on feed suppliers and make sure that the feeds are properly labeled and batch coded and stock rotated. These are kind of uh, inspection activities also to make sure they're properly stored in, in terms of uh, risks of mold growth and so on. Then you're, you need to have inspections on your veterinary medicines and withdrawal periods so you need to be looking at <coughs> to check that only authorized substances are applied you need to look in their drugstore see what they've got make sure there's no uh, malachite green sitting around there make sure there's no uh, bottles of chloramphenicol uh, solution and sometimes, you know, these things do, do happen because chloramphenicol you can maybe get from a human uh, pharmacy and then you start using it for, for fish. Uh, ensure that drugs are properly supervised from a veterinary point of view, that where drugs are prescribed, that there's a signature, uh, that cabinet drug storage is properly managed with a locked cabinet that there's a book which documents the applications of drugs that animals are uh, that fish are separated when they're subject to treatment I mean all, all of the things to make sure that what you've put in the regulations essentially are uh, uh, are followed and in terms of own checks the if veterinary medicines are applied by the aquaculture business operator of course they have to observe the withdrawal periods but they should also be checking the residues to make sure that the withdrawal periods are in fact effective in reducing the levels below the MRLs before the product is sent to market so there should be a periodic own check by the operator of these, uh, of these matters. Then you're looking at some of the general hygienic conditions, the uh, standard sanitation operating procedures, if you like, the, the GHPs, uh, which are 
pretty much the same kind of issues that you would want to look at in a, uh, in a processing establishment. So you're looking at pest control, cleaning schedules, uh, exclusion of domestic animals, uh, separate chemical storage, uh, if ice is used on the farm maybe for distribution that it has proper uh, storage conditions it's from a potable water supply, uh, hygiene conditions including of the staff, uh, hand washing, toilets, all of these kind of things need to be undertaken. Uh, then there is a requirement from the point of view of the competent authority to implement a residue monitoring plan and this is intended to check that the controls are functioning uh, to prevent contamination of uh, aquaculture animals with excessive uh, levels of uh, permitted compounds or with uh, non-permitted compounds and they are the two groups which we need to be monitoring, the two groups of compounds and this again is an EU requirement uh, that there is in place a residue monitoring plan and the EU sets these groups out as group A and group B and group A essentially are the, uh, the things which are banned, which are prohibited. In other words, anabolic steroids, in other words, growth promoters, are prohibited from use in all food animals in the European Union. Not in the USA, but in the EU they, they are. And unauthorized substances, in other words, are banned substances. So these are some of the things, uh, still beans, antithyroid agents, steroids, uh, lactones, beta agonists, these are all the things which have anabolic effects and may at different times be used as growth promoters. I don't know that there is any uh, clear evidence of any use of these in fish. The only use which we know of, of any of these substances, is in uh, sex reversal of tilapia. So that any person who is a serious tilapia farmer will want to grow monosex tilapia, uh, because if you don't have monosex all of the biomass that you uh, produce goes into them breeding uh, because they're, they have a high degree of fecundity and you end up with lots and lots and lots of small fish uh, which nobody wants to buy or eat rather than a smaller number of large fish which actually are the same weight in total but uh, are much more marketable. So the way in which you achieve this in tilapia farming is by uh, in the hatchery when the eggs have hatched you treat the uh, larval fish with a uh, methyl testosterone uh, bath and that turns them all into into little boys. So in terms of the uh, monitoring parameters which are to be considered in your residue monitoring program. We have a classification here uh, which is what is used by the European Union. Uh, the group A compounds, if you remember, are the ones which are uh, prohibited and group B are the ones which are, uh, include the uh, permitted drugs but also we want to monitor some of the uh, things which uh, may be present through natural uh, contamination or environmental contamination. So it includes 
things like environmental contaminants, organochlorine and organophosphorus compounds, chemical elements, mycotoxins, you see are there, as something to be monitored, dyes, which is the, uh, uh, which may also be used sometimes. So these are the, uh, this is how we design the, the monitoring program. Uh, see that you have a group of substances and then you identify certain specific ones. You find the substrate in which the test will be undertaken and the action level, the M MRL action level and the number of samples to be taken. So this would be your uh, monitoring plan, per se. And what you have to remember is that your group A substances, you are not necessarily looking for them in the final product. You're trying to identify, for example, if an illegal substance has been used anywhere in the production. So you may take samples of uh, fish, but from a hatchery, for example, from, uh, from uh, a cage of juveniles, rather than of the final product. When it comes, that's why we say the MRL is not set, because there isn't a, a limit there. These are prohibited substances. And we may take samples in uh, liver, parts of the animal which are not normally consumed, but where we know that things like malachite green might be concentrated, and therefore by analyzing for it in the liver, we have a greater chance of detecting it as being used. So your group A substances, the key to the thing to remember is that they may not be, uh, well, the sampling has to cover the whole of the production, cycle, whereas your, the group B substances, which are uh, concerning the final product, you take products uh, when they're harvested or on the way to market, or even at the level of the market, because here we're keen to check that uh, limits which are set for the final product in terms of various permitted drugs or in terms of PCBs, heavy metals, or aflatoxins are, are in fact uh, applied. Then, then in the EU, there is a sampling plan uh, globally for the sector, which is uh, set in the EU legislation which is one sample per 100 tonnes of annual production. So if you annually produce 1,000 tonnes of fish, you have to take a minimum of 10 samples uh, during the course of that year. And then one third of the samples uh, be taken at the farm on fish at all stages of farming. Okay, that means juveniles as well as fish which is ready to be placed on the market for consumption. And group B is two thirds of the total samples and they are taken uh, at the level of the market on the farm processing plant or during the market. So that is the sampling regime which is set out in the EU regulations. Okay, and I wanted to say a little bit more about uh, the other hazard which we encounter in farmed fish, particularly farmed fish which is produced in tropical waters in fresh water. Because I think we mentioned the other day that uh, fish born uh, trematodes and uh, trematodiasis is a potentially major problem. Uh, and we know that many people suffer from liver flukes, 
lung flukes due to the consumption of raw freshwater fish, increasingly from aquaculture. Um, so this is a, a major hazard, uh, and it is a problem in Southeast Asia. And there is also uh, a public health problem of liver flukes in South America, but it's not, as far as I know, specifically linked to fish consumption. It's more uh, to do with uh, other trematodes which uh, are transmitted by the consumption of uh, vegetables which have been grown in contaminated locations. Uh, but anyhow, uh, these, uh, there are millions of people affected by fishborne trematodes and certainly we should be cautious when we're growing things like tilapia or catfish in fresh water in tropical countries because there is always a potential risk of some uh, hazard to the present. Uh, and <coughs> the disease can be serious, but it is treatable. Uh, so these are the three main parasites, Monorchis sinensis, uh, Op Opistorchis species, different species, and Paragonis. These two are liver flukes, and this is a lung fluke. And they're all present in freshwater fish. This one, Paragonimus, is in freshwater crustacean. So uh, if there is production of macrobrachium, which is a freshwater shrimp, uh, typically grown in aquaculture systems, then this could be one of the hazards we need to be concerned about. Uh, so, in all cases, the final hosts are uh, in mammals, so that can be humans or cats or dogs. They have an intermediate host, uh, often in uh, aquatic invertebrate, such as a snail, and uh, another intermediate host is, is the fish. So they have various life cycles. Uh, this kind of shows how it works. You have your final host where the uh, parasite is living in the liver or wild ducts or the lungs, and this final host excretes the eggs, which then hatch into larval stages. They pass through snails as one of the intermediate hosts. They release in a larval stage called the cercaria. These enter the flesh of fish, and then consumption of that fish where they insist uh, into a stable form in the, in the muscle, the metasarcaria, in the flesh or the muscle of the skin, but that is then consumed by the final host, then uh, that desists and you get the parasite growing once again in the, in the animal. So this, this photograph here, these are uh, fluke cysts in the muscle of fish. So if you ate this without cooking it, then you would be in trouble. Okay. But bear in mind that there is also the possibility of cross-contamination. So as with, okay, these are they're not as microscopic as bacteria, they're very really small, but it is always possible that from a a chopping board or uh, utensils, they could be transferred from a raw product to a cooked product in the same way that we might transmit bacteria from raw meat to a cooked meat by lack of hygiene with our uh, utensils. Uh, so there is a need to take a degree of care there and make sure that we have 
uh, control methods. Right? Not always entirely possible to eliminate these completely from fish farms, especially in areas where they are endemic. Uh, but to do things like having good practices, toilet facilities for staff, for a start, so there's no possibility of fecal material from people uh, to enter ponds. The same way, keep domestic animals away from ponds. I find it uh, many, many times I go around fish farms and you see uh, dogs that are there running around as guard dogs. You see goats are grazing <coughs> the sides of ponds because it keeps the grass short and the boys are having to pay somebody to cut the grass. But these are not good practices because uh, there could be uh, the possibility of with material which has parasite eggs into the ponds. Drain and line the ponds after every harvest uh, to kill the parasites as snail eggs. Uh, and control your snails. You, know, you can have various compounds which uh, kill the snails and bodies or so keep the snail population down. And filter in that water to stop Larval stages of snails from coming into the, uh, into the pond. And then you can have some passive steps. We know that freezing of the fish is one way to kill these parasites. Uh, in the same way that uh, uh, we use freezing of uh, herring in Europe to kill nematode parasites. Uh, we can freeze the fish but also have the same effect with the tramatoids. And also public information. Inform people don't eat raw tropical freshwater fish or crustacea because they may be susceptible to these kind of hazards and in fact they may have uh, may also be a risk of cross contamination. Okay, so that's uh, aquaculture hazards and controls.